We're going to be moving along with uh, panel number two for the day, uh, which we've entitled What's Hot and What's Not Under Sunny Ways. Uh, so on this panel, we'll be hearing from Michelle Chadwick, who is lead of regulatory review of drugs and devices at Health Canada, followed by Wayne Critchley, who's a senior associate at Global Public Affairs, Health and Life Sciences, and followed by Sarah Berglas, who is patient engagement officer for the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health. So thank you. Hello all. So I have about 15 minutes. I could go on for two hours about this. Uh, but there's a few things that I really wanted to focus on, um, especially um, uh, related to patient uh, input. And one area, um, and this is sort of the crux to the, the new initiative that we're embarking on uh, called Regulatory Review of Drugs and Devices, and that is the concept of health care system need. So that is something that we really are looking for your input on. Um, now, um, if, if you could uh, provide a, a group input, that would be wonderful, uh, but looking for anything in writing related to that. So, so we'll touch on that um, within this presentation. But um, this initiative, Regulatory Review of Drugs and Devices, um, it was born out of the mandate letter of the health minister from 2015 and continues in the current mandate letter. So one thing that I really wanted to stress um, is that in looking at all of these 15 projects uh, and looking at new ways of working, we as always continue to focus on that, um, our mandate which is safety, efficacy, um, and quality of therapeutic products. So uh, in being in the regulatory side of, of things, cost um, at this point, is, well, it's just not an issue. What we need to do is get the product to the market and then others can deal with cost. Uh, <laughs> so I'm kind of lucky uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm almost overwhelmed with, uh, with all the talk of costs, et cetera. Um, but, and I definitely don't have any answers for you, but uh, uh, very surprised at, at just uh, how, how much the talk is on that these days. All right, so um, wanted to, to, to look at some of the, the projects, the 15 projects that we're working on, and uh, implications for Canadians generally and health partners. And really, availability is key uh, for us. We want to make um, drugs um, available as fast as possible, as soon as possible, so that um, those products, especially those that meet that health care system need, uh, are on the market and available. So um, some of the ways that we uh, plan to do that are really trying to reduce the lag time between Health Canada review and then the Health Technology Assessor review. So um, we've, we've actually got a, a pilot project uh, ongoing with respect to this and uh, one of the pilot projects finished um, and that um, we've saved about seven weeks. So that's right off the top seven weeks. Now, the Health Canada review, um, you know, the timing of that was the same, um, but where we, we save time is between Health Canada and CADETH. Um, instead of, you know, doing the reviews um, uh, um, one after the other, we were able to do part of the review in parallel. So, so that's a really big win, I think, seven weeks. Um, now, that's not to say that this will happen with all, um, and there was specific attention on this pilot project, but I mean, it's not going to make it longer, that's for sure. Um, another is all about um, looking at that priority review policy. Right now, um, it's really for, for drugs that are, are used to, for life-threatening conditions. And we really want to expand that to include healthcare system needs. So instead of 300 days for review, it's 180 days for review. Uh, I mean, there's um, screening and, um, you know, for those submissions that aren't, um, don't have all of the information, there's more time. But, but generally, Generally, just to give you a quick snapshot, um, that would be definitely uh, a number of days of savings at the very least. And then, um, and something that we've been talking about um, at this uh, conference is uh, real world evidence and really the idea and concept of reviewing products throughout their life cycle. So um, those three uh, ideas and concepts are, are things that we're, we're looking at with these 15 projects moving forward. 
So, uh, mentioned the, the mandate commitment. One, uh, this is the one place I can actually talk about cost, but I mean, in terms of budget. Uh, close to $71 million has been um, received um, to support regulatory review of drugs and devices. Now, in terms of how that's broken down for these 15 projects, uh, have those numbers, but generally, there's a lot of policy work on the front end, and that tapers off as the projects um, evolve, and the majority of the, the, the budget is for um, review capacity. So that's all good. That that's just means that things are going to be available faster, sooner. So looking at the, uh, the, the 15 projects, I'm sure you can't see them all by here, but um, uh, basically our objective is an agile regulatory system that supports better availability of therapeutic products based on healthcare system needs. So that is why that definition is really important to us and we have no preconceived notions about what that healthcare system need definition is and, it's re and, and we don't really have any skin in the game on it either. So you know, we can be very objective about what we think that uh, you know what you know about what um, what that definition becomes. Um, it's really a tabula rasa. It's uh, it's an open book at this point in time. So get in those uh, thoughts in terms of a healthcare system need concept. Um, I, I will tell you about a few ideas that others have given us, uh, but uh, that's where we're at right now. So really looking for your input. All right, so 15 projects under four pillars. So the, the four pillars are expanded collaboration with health partners. So that's working with health technology assessors, CADF internationally, uh, looking at more timely um, availability of drugs and devices. That's the second pillar. Uh, uh, that's where the priority review policy is being re-looked at. And then the, uh, the next is enhanced uh, use of real world evidence. Uh, and that's um, the post-market realm, uh, review of products throughout its life cycle, and then modern and flexible operations. In part, this is going to pay for this in the long term, uh, and, and this um, is about appropriate the appropriate cost recovery framework, uh, putting our cost recovery um, of the submission review in line with uh, international partners. Um, and right now, the, uh, the first five years, um, that $71 million is how we're paying for this project. And then future, especially that review capacity, and that's all that will remain actually, will be um, the way it's through the cost recovery that we will be paying for that um, moving forward. All right, so uh, just to give you an overview of a, a few key uh, R2D2 projects, we, we like to call it affectionately. Uh, the first is alignment of the health technology assessment review with the Health Canada review. So this is a parallel review. This is the where we, so we're saving that um, with that pilot project that seven weeks. So that portions of the, this is really about how portions of the review complete, be completed in parallel. So the, the benefit here is, is really uh, quite clear. It's uh, access, um, or improving availability. And uh, wanted to clarify that this is about timing only, um, and we're not collaborating at all with respect to the reviews. Our mandates are separate and clear. So it's all about uh, timing. That said, um, like never before, uh, CADF, uh, we're working um, more hand in hand with CADF, uh, the French equivalent INS, uh, and this only is a positive thing. Uh, we'll be able to work more efficiently and uh, find other probable projects to work together on and uh, time savings. All right, so early parallel scientific advice, and this is one place in particular where patient input is going to be key. Uh, this is about um, looking at um, submissions, or not submissions, but um, clinical trials early on um, in the process, um, really early, and uh, uh, speaking with industry, uh, working with CADF on this, and determining what clinical trials are needed to move forward um, in order to get the product approved. So uh, possible clinical trials that are not needed uh, won't, will not be um, 
uh, that'll save time because those clinical trials won't need to proceed. And uh, so hopefully um, we can give consistent um, advice between Health Canada and CADETH in terms of what is needed. And this is especially where uh, patients can provide input um, in terms of quality outcomes, et cetera, so they could be at the table. And we're really um, interested in what CADETH has done in terms of their, uh, their surveys. I know it's not perfect, but it's definitely a start and they're doing a, a lot of good work and have, have really started that work. So um, uh, I, we're really looking at them and all of you to, to help with that process. All right, so use of foreign review decisions. There's really two arms to this project. The first is uh, developing a guidance uh, for systematic use of foreign reviews. And uh, we're not, um, in, in some cases, we're going to be review using the review of a foreign area exclusively, but that's for um, really special cases where there's a product on the special access program um, that um, has been on the special access for quite a while, and um, that's really a circumventing of the regulations. But uh, what we want to do is get those products um, through the review process so they can be approved, so that we have safety data on them, um, and so that we know that products that uh, Canadians are using are uh, safe, effective, and, and of good quality. Uh, and um, the second piece um, with respect to this is the, the, the actual use of the foreign review. So guidance, um, not only looking at the full use of the review, but also um, when it's used in combination with some Canadian data or all Canadian data and uh, as an add-on. We just want to be consistent in how we use that. Uh, all right. Uh, international collaboration and work sharing. Uh, we are going to be doing a pilot project with Australia, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, uh, and look at ways we can work together to um, really um, provide value added in the review process, uh, look at the strengths of both organizations and work from there and also work at, at saving time, economies of scale, that kind of thing. So in the end should mean a faster availability of drugs that are of good quality, safety, and uh, efficacious. All right, expansion of the priority review pathways. Now, this is all about uh, thinking in terms of that healthcare system need definition and inputting it into this policy or something like a policy. Uh, and uh, uh, this is where that healthcare system need concept um, comes into play, one of the places. Uh, early scientific advice as well is, is where that healthcare system need concept will be used, but possible criteria uh, could include uh, rare diseases, and I, I mean, I think that's a given pretty much. Uh, cost effectiveness in some cases, savings to the healthcare system. Now this may be, you know, for a more expensive medication, but it may enable um, a patient to stay at the home longer and not have to be in the, the healthcare system and using healthcare funds. So that, that, that's a consideration. Um, emergency use, uh, emerging or anticipated health, health uh, public health need, uh, that, that's another possibility in terms of uh, some criteria. And these are just some criteria that uh, uh, various stakeholders have provided to us. Um, so we have no preconceived notions of regarding this. So please provide your, your input, much appreciated. And um, okay, the next two are, are kind of sister projects. Uh, improved availability of uh, biosimilars and biologics. Biosimilars, uh, things are coming off of patent, drugs are coming off of patent hold, and uh, there's a lot of biosimilars that need to be reviewed, so this is about review capacity. But also the, uh, the food and drug regulations are really old for division four of the regulations. Uh, uh, the definition of insulin, the expiry dates, all that kind of um, uh, wording is, is inaccurate now with our new technological advances. Expiry dates may be further out, um, so those re are really need to be reworked. So that's part of that project. Uh, the next is improved availability of generic drugs. Uh, some, some of the sum submission review processes are backlog. This is a capacity to, to reduce um, the backlog so that uh, availability of drugs comes sooner. And also there's um, 
uh, technological advances, uh, making that definition of pharmaceutical equivalent kind of murky and gray. Uh, so we really need to amend the food and drug regulations so that um, th those are more usable with respect to those terms. Uh, so that, again, uh, availability of generics um, comes sooner to you. And uh, the special access program. Uh, this is a big project, uh, a number of pieces to this. Um, I'm not sure if how many of you are still using fax machines, um, but we do, <laughs> sad to say, uh, we are. So we want to modernize that a little um, and stop relying on those faxes. Uh, we're looking at block release. Um, this is more for um, situations where there's a potential emergency, a stockpiling for emergency situations through the public health agency. So a block release for large groups of patients uh, or potential patients. Uh, fast track mechanisms for repeat uh, requests. Uh, we want more of a web presence um, and some outreach. We want to be more transparent and consistent in our decisions uh, with respect to SAP. And um, as well, we're looking at uh, really look at the, the SAP process and looking at using it for what it was originally intended. And for those, you know, big, those drugs that are being used uh, quite frequently through SAP, we want to look at other mechanisms by which they can be accessed but approved at the same, so that, you know, that we know for sure that they're not only safe but efficacious and of suitable quality. And the last, uh, real world evidence. We've been speaking a lot about that today. Uh, this is about a um, really being able to use that data that we were talking about and turning that into evidence. Um, our capacity in that area is, it, it could improve. So we want to um, develop that capacity more so that we can turn data into evidence. We also want to get more data. Uh, that can be turned strategically into evidence. Um, so the way that we're going to be proceeding to get more data is through collaboration with our domestic and international partners, uh, as well as acquiring data in, in some cases. Uh, and again, we want to be able to use that strategically so there is evidence that we can use to really uh, review products, uh, drugs, and devices throughout the whole life cycle of the product. All right, so expected results, predictability, flexibility, um, access, key, I've said that a few times, but th that's a big theme. Um, and benefits to Canadians, again, uh, Canadians will be better informed about the benefits and the risks of therapeutic products. One of the uh, projects that I didn't talk about was uh, access to clinical data. Um, and this is not considered to be, you know, the uh, Colonel Sanders recipe or anything like that, but clinical data that is not considered to be confidential business information so that Canadians can make better use um, of uh, information that is available um, to make uh, decisions about their uh, drug choices. Uh, and uh, with the cost recovery, taxpayers will bear a lower cost of the review of submissions. So that's um, another thing. Uh, benefits to health partners, collaboration, uh, alignment with between Health Canada and the provinces, and more timely and tan transparent review of drugs from the Health Canada perspective, and uh, that post-market piece as well, and uh, ability to uh, review and uh, collaborate with respect to uh, data post-market. And that is it for me. So I uh, really want to hear your thoughts. And actually, that uh, panel there, healthcare system need, um, just challenge you to uh, come up with um, some ideas there, because that, uh, that's important. OK, uh, thanks for your time. And uh, looking forward to talking with you today and uh, tomorrow. And I'm around all the time. So don't hesitate to come speak to me. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, well, first of all, thanks to uh, Louise and all the organizers for including me in this event. I'm really delighted to be here and to see so many uh, familiar faces. Sophie asked us right off the top to make sure we identify who we are and what our affiliations are. So Wayne Critchley, I'm currently with Global Public Affairs uh, based in Ottawa, but we work across the country. Um, in my free time, 
I'm involved in a number of other activities, including uh, patient organizations, in particular the C Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders, where I currently serve as uh, chair uh, of the board. My history includes a long stint as executive director of the PMPRB, which we're going to be talking about uh, today. Uh, and, but since I left PMPRB 12 years ago now, uh, I've spent some time at Cadeth as a vice president uh, there in some of the transitional stages they had about eight, nine years ago, and uh, with uh, a couple of other organizations before staying where I am now for a little while. I, I move around almost as much as Louise does. <laughs> Um, Louise commented on our uh, Greek chorus over here, and I certainly need to acknowledge them, especially because although, Louise, you may think of them as a chorus, I, 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 I look at them from this vantage point in another way. I think of the, them as the judges on American Idol. <laughs> and, and, and I'm thinking, that Phil, Phil, yeah, that Phil, Phil Upshaw is doing a very good Simon Cowell impersonation. <laughs> anyway. So we're here to talk about, this is a drug pricing summit, we're here to talk about pricing. And uh, in my case, I'm going to talk about it from the federal government perspective, obviously in line with uh, my career. So what's hot and what's not? Well, certainly what's hot is drug price reform. The federal government has launched uh, the first major reform of federal policies with respect to drug pricing in 30 years. So that's hot. Uh, it may not be at the top of everybody's uh, agenda of uh, important issues, but the fact is it's, it's fairly significant in my view. So I want to talk about how we got there, what it's all about. Um, and, and part of that we see in the uh, platform of the uh, current government when they ran before the last election, where they said they were going to review the PMPRB. First time in my life I ever heard any political party even acknowledge awareness of PMPRB, let, him, let alone put it in their, in their political platform. So that was a signal. And sure enough, in the mandate letters to the health ministers, uh, there's been a real emphasis on improving access to necessary prescription medications, joining with the provincial provinces and territories in the PCPA, the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, and reducing costs and making prices more affordable for Canadians. Health Canada, I think uh, Michelle has already touched on uh, the, some of the priorities on the regulatory side, but the Minister, has, Minister of Health federally has joined with her counterparts provincially in adopting the three A's. And these are the, this is the real focus. You want to talk to a provincial health minister, think about the three A's before you do that when you go in there. Affordability, accessibility, and appropriate use. And from the federal perspective, affordability when you, look at, when you look at this through the lens of the federal health minister, who, let's face it, doesn't do a lot in terms of drug coverage, uh, from her perspective, what can she do? Well, she has this tool called the PMPRB. That's her tool, and so that is a way she can attempt to deal with the affordability challenge. So uh, I'm just going to take a, a second or two just to, maybe just to refresh you on some of the basics of what the PMPRB is and what it does. It, it is a federal body that is a quasi-judicial body. It has significant powers to enforce its rulings uh, in establishing excessive, or pardon me, non-excessive prices for drugs. So if it finds a drug is priced excessively, it can order a rollback and, and do many other things. It's a pretty, a, a pretty strong power, actually. It's rarely used because the board has always worked on the assumption that it cannot afford to have hearings that last for five or ten years to get a resolution in the courts. It needs to get voluntary compliance by establishing clear guidelines that manufacturers can follow. And the system has largely worked. Canadian prices used to be much, much higher relative to other countries. They dropped very quickly 30 years ago when the PMPRB came in. The PMPRB immediately put a, a stop to price increases greater than the rate of inflation. If you look at the rate of price increases in the U.S., that's what we used to have before. So the PMPRB has achieved a fair bit. It's brought prices in Canada for patented drugs in line with European countries. That had not been the case. So, uh, but, what's, but things have changed. That was 30 years ago. It is time for reform, no question about that. Um, oh, by the way, I forgot one thing, Sophie. 
I was supposed to say if my comments were mine or, or one of the organizations that I'm involved with, they're mine. <laughs> no one else has responsibility for these, so I want to make that crystal clear. <laughs> Whew. Um, so uh, so why, why the change? Well, the world has changed dramatically. Fifteen years ago, we didn't have Common Drug Review. We didn't have PCODER. We didn't have the PCPA. We had only the beginnings of rudimentary attempts to look at cost effectiveness and value for money in public drug funding decisions. So PMPRB felt it was relevant at that time because it set a, a, an upper limit on prices. Since then, it's become concerned that it's not relevant. What, what does it do? It, they may have a rule about what the price can be, but manufacturers often come in at a price lower than that, and they uh, then are prepared to negotiate uh, rebates and deals for listings. So is the PMPRB relevant? So the PMPRB has been on an exercise for a couple of years. I put up these two tweets because I think that it, it really reflects the nub of this issue, which is, is the glass half full? Or is it half empty? Because the PMPRB itself can acknowledge on the left-hand side that Canadian prices are in line with prices in Europe and well below those in the US. That was its goal for 30 years, and that's the case. On the right, though, if you move the yardsticks, we may be in line with European prices, but we're well above the median of the OECD. Well, that's a new, that's a new measurement, uh, and, uh, and that's true. Uh, a few years ago, 28% higher, which is the uh, figure quoted in, in this tweet. Actually, in the late last annual report from the PMPRB, it's 20% higher. So the difference is narrowing, but it's still a significant difference. So uh, the question is, is that the appropriate yardstick? So we can come to that in a moment. So when M Minister Philpott uh, decided to proceed on regulatory reform in the spring, she announced uh, a suite of changes to uh, PMPRB. And these are quite, they get quite detailed. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but we'll be happy to discuss any of them with you later on. But we're going to add new price determination factors uh, for PMPRB to take into account in deciding if a price is excessive. Uh, they're going to change the basket of countries to move from the median of this European basket of six European countries to the median of the OECD countries. Uh, they're going to require manufacturers to report information on the confidential rebates that are currently provided to provincial governments and uh, some private payers. And they've been given more money. The budget 2017 uh, had, and, and I think uh, Michelle had the, the numbers there, uh, of a, a large sum of money going to Health Canada CADF and to PMPRB. So PMPRB has already begun the process of expanding and uh, looking at what its needs are for more staff come April 1 uh, as it implements these, uh, these new powers. So where are we in the process? Well, Minister put out the consultation paper in the spring. Everybody had an opportunity to provide uh, input on that. There were over 100 submissions, and I know many people in this room were involved in making submissions, and congratulations, and, and thank you for doing that. It's good to see that level of, of interest. Uh, we are now waiting for the next stage, which will be pre-publication of proposed regulations in the Canada Gazette, which should happen any day now. Uh, and uh, there'll be further written consultation on that, uh, but more significantly at that point, uh, the PMPRB will begin further consultations, uh, engaging stakeholders on how to implement those new regulations. What, in fact, will they mean? So just one comment to make is that they, the PMPAB says that it, it wants a risk-based approach. So it, em it emphasizes those, those drugs that are the most significant and important. And when you ask them, they'll say, it's the high-cost orphan drugs. That's what we're concerned about. And it's, and, and, and sorry, Fred, I don't want to contradict you, but it's, it's a hep C type situation. that are high expenditure drugs. Uh, those are the two areas that concern us because that's what provincial drug plans tell us are the biggest concerns for them in managing their budgets. So that's their area of focus. But in fact, they're not really reducing their scope of regulation except to stop looking at patented generic drugs of which there are not very many. They're still going to look at all multiple source drugs, all line extensions. There's no changes to that. 
They're going to look at pharmacoeconomics. Question that I ask, again, this is a personal comment, Sophie, okay? Don't attribute it to anybody else. But I have to ask, why is PMPRB going to look at HTA? Cadeth already looks at HTA. PMPRB is talking about establishing a fixed cost per quality threshold, basically saying that is the price, maximum price. Uh, well, we all know that a fixed cost per quality is pretty tough because you can get two economists in a room and they're not going to agree on what the cost per quality is. So that's going to be very tough. Uh, Canada would become uh, one of two or three agencies in the whole world that would attempt to establish a fixed cost per quality. And in the other cases, they use it for purposes of negotiation, not to set a legal limit on price that uh, you are required to comply with. So there's a whole host of questions about this that will have to be addressed in the consultation on guidelines next year. Market size. This one would, would go after the hep C type situation where they want to set a price threshold based on the total, likely total expenditures on the drug, which is an interesting kind of concept. And also based on, on a new concept of affordability related somehow to GDP. So these are, there's some very good academic work and thinking going on internationally on some of these issues. Uh, I think these are things that should, if they don't already, should help inform a PCPA negotiation where you're actually negotiating uh, price and looking at a whole host of factors. But PMPRB is talking about they would like to put this as a fixed, they'll fix a number and say that's the number and that's what you're, that's what you're stuck with. You can see where I'm going with this. <laughs> Basket of countries. The only comment I'll make on that is that the OECD is a very important group of countries. There's about 30 countries in the OECD. Includes countries, uh, obviously, like Canada and the US, UK, France, Germany. It also includes Turkey, Romania, Lithuania, uh, Greece, a number of countries. And we don't necessarily aspire to a healthcare system at the same level of some of those countries. No offense to them. We aspire to higher. I think we do, anyway. Uh, but, but again, they're looking at setting a standard that would put us at the median of the OECD. And there's questions about how that would be implemented. Uh, remember I said earlier, you want clear, bright guidelines that people can follow easily. But you're going to have a lot of questions about how you calculate those prices, uh, what you do if, when you've only got sales in certain countries and not others. I could go on. The final point is on the confidential rebates uh, how, uh, and how the PMPRB is going to use that. So I'll let, I'll let the public drug plan managers worry about that and what they think about whether that information should go into the PMPRB hopper and how that's going to impact them. I know I'm getting short on time, so I'm going to run through very quickly my, my hit list of winners and losers. And I, I think it's very clear to any objective observer, the big winner in the PMPRB proposals is the private insurance industry. Because public payers already receive rebates. They're receiving close to 1.5 billion in, in rebates on an annual basis. Minister Philpott said she would say three billion through this process. Well, guess what? Public counts for uh, less than, well less than 50% of total spending. So they're getting a good chunk of it already, if not all of it. So that's a question mark. Uh, cash payers, an important issue, yes. Cash payers should benefit. But the real issue for cash payers, I would argue, is not price. The real issue is access and coverage. Do you have appropriate coverage? That's a topic for another day. Academics, lawyers, and consultants? Well, I should like these proposals. <laughs> no one can understand them. Everyone's trying to figure out how they're going to work. Uh, so, you know, but, but really, I didn't go into government to give more work to uh, consultants, quite frankly. Uh, and, and I would hate to see pricing get bogged down in the courts. The, the PMPRB has done applying its current rules and its current framework. It has conducted a hearing uh, into the price of Solaris, which you may have seen. And that process began almost three years ago. It took 32 months to get to a decision from the board on price. That decision is now under appeal in the courts and will go on for several years. So just think about that and how does that impact a public or private drug plan trying to manage a budget? How does it impact you as a patient? Does that mean that drug's going to be available to you? Or is everyone going to say, we've got to wait till that price gets settled and figured out? 
before we can make it available. We don't know the answers to those questions, but those are things that I think we need to think about. Uh, the losers, obviously, the, the biopharmaceutical industry is a loser, um, but you know they're used to winning and losing in different markets, and they'll accommodate and adapt to it. They do that all the time, and, I, and you know. But but the issue that we don't know, we don't know what will be the impact on launches in Canada. If you're facing a market with a significant lower price threshold and or pricing uncertainty. Are you going to want to rush into this market? Or are you going to want to hold back and wait till things settle down or until you're settled in other markets where prices are stabilized before you come to Canada? We don't know. It's hard to predict that, although some work that the PMPRB itself did last spring suggested that, uh, th that this will have the effect of delaying the launch of new drugs into Canada. So that, to me, is probably the major concern for patients. On the face of it, Everyone wants a lower price. Gosh, every time I fill up my car with gas, I'd sure like the price to be lower. Every time I pay my, my uh, cell phone bill, I sure wish the price were lower. You know, We all want lower prices, but what will be the impact? And I don't think we've had a real assessment yet on what the impact will be. The toss-up, public drug plans, to me, it's a, it's, that's still a toss-up. And I'm sure they're trying to figure out themselves. I know, I know some of them think this is a great idea. Some are a little less less uh, sold on that, uh, but, but it's a toss-up. Uh, I'm curious of how, I don't know if Cadiz has any views yet, or ones that they would share, uh, about what they think it will, how this will impact them. But right now, Cadiz is clearly the gold standard in this country in terms of HTA. It's a, one of the gold standards internationally. So how is the PMPRB assessment of HTA going to impact uh, Cadiz? And what will happen if they come to a different conclusion from what Cadiz came to? How is that going to play into the negotiations that go into PCPA? We don't know any of this yet, uh, but uh, those are questions that uh, many of us are raising. So what do we need to do besides worrying? <laughs> well, <laughs> I know the people in this room, no one sits around and worries. <laughs> people get active and get busy and start doing something. So I think the first thing is to keep abreast of what's going on. Take an active role when there's opportunities for consultations. Uh, take an active role. Discuss it with your uh, provincial health uh, ministries uh, and, uh, and make sure that, that you understand where they're coming from and that they've assessed the implications for them and, and, and what the best policy decisions are. Make sure you understand. T take what I've said today with a big grain of salt. Test it out, validate it. Uh, check around and, and, and try and get a, a more information. Uh, be ready to consult on this next stage of the regulatory package, which, as I said, could be any day now, uh, and certainly be ready to be engaged with PMPRB. One point I didn't mention is that unlike CADETH, uh, unlike CDR and PCODER and some of the provincial uh, programs, the PMPRB has no mechanism for patient input. Uh, when it comes to individual uh, cases that they look at. But they do involve patients in their policy discussions, so there will be full opportunity for patients. In fact, they'll be looking for you. They'll come to you even. They may come and ask you uh, to uh, work with them in working groups to represent patient interests in, in their, some of their working groups as they try to work through the implications of these changes uh, in the coming year. So I really encourage you to try and make yourself available for that and identify uh, those among people you know who, who might be interested and qualified to, uh, to do that. So on that, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you very much. So as you can see, I'm not Brian O'Rourke. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit shorter. Um, Brian is our uh, CADET CEO, and um, nor am I one of the directors um, who might normally come to such events. Unfortunately, November the 15th is just an incredibly busy day for us at CADET. So, Brian felt, though, it was really important that somebody from CADET be here. So, I've come along, and I'm going to share our um, health technology management strategy. I'm going to answer the questions that I can, 
And equally important, I'm, I'm really privileged to be here to be able to listen, to be able to, to hear the, the views and, and ideas that have been shared here in this room. So before we move on, let's see, make this work. No. On my point, need to point out. There we go, and maybe need to press harder. Anyway, before we begin, I just wanted to share a disclosure. We'll disclose where Cadith receives our funding from. Um, from the federal, provincial, territorial governments. We also receive funding from industry. And a little bit about CADF. As you know, we're an independent agency. And kind of what we do in, in plain language is that we find and assess research on drugs, devices and procedures to give advice to health authorities, hospitals, long-term care homes, Health, public health agencies, drug plans, and departments of health. And the evidence that we assess and the advice that we give, we share it on our website so that others can also benefit from that information. Now, I'm sure many people here are very familiar with the Common Drug Review and the Pan-Canadian Oncology Review. I also wanted to share a little bit of the broader sense of what else CADETH does. Um, so last year, in addition to the 70 drug reviews that we did, Cadeth also did 272 rapid responses. And they're very short reports in directly answering very specific questions that come from clinicians, that come from health authorities, that come from hospitals. And just a few that were published just this week, we've got them um, about neurofeedback and biofeedback for mood and anxiety disorders. Um, nurses as first responders in rural and remote locations, and electrostatic cleaning devices for healthcare facility stations. So it's, it's quite a broad range, but they're really trying to answer specific questions very broadly. We also did 16 environmental and horizon scans, and so that's looking at what is the landscape um, in healthcare. And our horizon scans give healthcare uh, leaders a glimpse of what's going to be there in the future. And Cadeth also did eight uh, comprehensive health technology optimal use projects where we look at multiple projects together. Um, we do ones on sleep apnea, also in, in vision. All right, so talking about health technology management, looking to the future, in, uh, some echoes of what Michelle had said, a little bit brighter than uh, what Wayne presented. So talking about our new strategy, now this began as a high-level proposal in response to a federal government ask. Um, CAD has now received additional funding, received $36 million over, spread over five years, with the bulk of that funding in the last two years. And that's to support ideas within that proposal. So we're in the process at Cadith of turning those ideas into sort of a high-level, multi-year plan. Now, what does that mean for patients? Well, we're recognizing both the potential of emerging technologies, but also existing technologies to be able to contribute to improved patient outcomes and health system outcomes. And when I say technologies, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not meaning computers or IT systems. I'm talking about medicines. I'm talking about medical devices that might be a Band-Aid or a suture thread. It might also be something like an MRI machine um, or, or uh, some different procedures that are done or diagnostic tests. So the goal behind sort of a greater management of technologies is that if we can improve, and here are some of these A words, the affordability and accessibility of technologies and the appropriate use of technologies, then this is gonna to lead to better health for Canadian citizens, better patient experiences when people are receiving care, and better value for citizens. So this is a little bit more specifics about what exactly is health technology management, or HTM. CADETH loves acronyms, we really do. So at present, um, both CDR and PCODA are really focused on managed entry. That's whether or not drugs as they come to Canada should be added to a formulary. 
HTM looks much more broadly than this. So it looks at the management of technologies over time, right from the pre-market phase, before they enter into Canada, along to the adaption, real world use, and then managing the exit. And as I illustrated in that early slide about what Cadeth does, we're already involved in lots of these different areas. We're involved in the pre-market phase with some of our horizon scanning and the scientific advice. Um, we're looking at appropriate use with our rapid responses and optimal use projects. So essentially, health technology management builds on the science of technology assessment, but it's also got an increased focus along that whole breadth and also looking much more at increasing stakeholder engagement and implementation support. So there are four kind of main areas of focus for Cadeth for the next few years. First one here is um, governance and priority setting. We need to make sure that the work we're doing at Cadeth really reflects the priorities of the Canadian healthcare system. We're going to be expanding our horizon scanning so that it helps health ministries and authorities be prepared from a budgetary standpoint to be ahead of that technology curve. We're also going to be looking at improving our scope of our reviews and giving some explicit consideration to unique needs. Um, an example of this is a, a recent project we did looking at um, home-based dialysis versus incentive dialysis for people with kidney disease. So in addition to looking at the clinical evidence, in addition to looking at the economics, we also considered patient perspectives, ethical considerations, implementation considerations. And when we didn't find enough evidence that we were looking through that was available in the systematic, we did specific supplementary reviews to look at well, what might the impact be for patients in a rural and remote setting in Canada and patients in indigenous communities. So all those threads were pulled together as we're looking at making recommendations. We want to continue to amplify some of those vulnerable uh, voices. So finally, a lot of the uh, work we do in the rapid responses at Cadeth helps with procurement decisions by hospitals and health authorities. This is going to expand. We're also going to be working more closely with the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance. Right now, we've got a member of that office um, who attends the expert committee meetings as an observer, and Cadeth shares our information uh, with the PCPA. Next big arm is the um, ass assessment along the technology life cycle. And I heard a little bit about this again with Michelle, and look, working much more closely with Health Canada um, with benefit of, of, to patients of that earlier access to promising technologies. And again, as Michelle mentioned, an example of that collaboration was that pilot initiative with PCODA and the Bureau of Metabolism, Oncology and Reproductive Science, a division of Health Canada. And uh, Alex Chambers, the director of PCODA, has a lot more of those details, but essentially kind of that goal was to really help us both understand each other's process and explore opportunities um, for a more integrated model. On the scientific advice, Cadeth launched that in 2015 um, to be able to give advice to pharmaceutical companies on their clinical trial development. Patients have been involved in every single one of those scientific advice projects since that began. And we had patients were involved in helping us work out how we can involve patients in that project. So that's something I'm really proud of. Um, it's seen success and we're growing that program. And a benefit is for Cadeth and for patients is that um, the patients have got a ch chance to, to be able to influence innovation in clinical trials. Without that trials, we don't have that evidence. Also, if we're looking at how technologies are being used over time, we can draw on many sources of data. Um, rather, rather than um, the, some of the sources of data that we can draw on are observational data, regular, uh, registries, administrative data, rather than if we're just looking at that managed entry, we're kind of relying on the clinical trial data that was typically done from a regulatory standpoint, which is typically placebo, 
uh, randomized control trials. So Cadeth is not going to be a collector of the data, but we're certainly working, trying to work in as many different partnerships to be able to have access to the data. Third big arm is the knowledge mobilization. Without action, a report is simply a piece of paper. And Cadeth has got liaison officers all across Canada, and we've done so for many years. We're going to be expanding some of that local support in Saskatchewan at first, where there's a, been a direct ask, and we're also looking doing more support on the ground in the Atlantic provinces. Importantly, we're looking at how we can have ways to well-supported approaches to be able to involve patients and providers in all steps of that HTM process. So this might involve identifying needs, priority setting, contributing experiences and perspectives, sharing our reports, also in the development of those processes and those programs. So this is a really exciting time. And here we go, finally, Cadeth, we're all about evidence. So we've got to demonstrate the value that Cadeth brings. So we've got to be more transparent about setting metrics, identifying those, sharing those that are less transactional, how many reports we produce, and more about kind of outcomes. So here's a nice slide just as a summary. Um, the strategy is to looking at health technology management, which covers more of the innovation terrain, considers real world evaluative information over the technology life cycle, takes in consideration some of the contextual factors that impact decision makers at all levels, and greater incorporates patient and provider perspectives with kind of the overarching aim that we support decision making in the service of better health, better patient experience, and better value. And then finally, before we move to questions, just highlighting the Cadet Symposium. Um, we really very much value having patient voices be part of that conversation at the symposium. And we're, uh, Cadet is making patient travel grants available. So if you're interested, please apply by the 8th of December. And we will be sharing some of those sessions via webinar for those who can't make it to Halifax. So thank you. All right, thank you very much for some great presentations. I will hand it over to our patient panel to comment and ask questions. Uh, maybe I'll start since Martine started last time. Uh, we'll go in order. Um, I have a couple of comments. I mean, it's Health Canada, a little bit about their patient uh, call for patient input. Uh, it's nice to see a call for patient input. Uh, the organization that I represent, the Canadian Arthritis Patient Alliance, have been providing input over the last couple years when asked. Uh, it still seems like it's a bit of a big black hole. We get a response from somebody that says, thank you for your input, and then we hear nothing. So I think what needs to happen is more of a dialogue exchange of information, an ongoing relationship building, I think is missing right now in a big way. I mean, many of us in this room were sitting here uh, about 15 years ago when the talk was about a national pharmaceutical strategy and there was real world safety, special access program, um, all the same things were being discussed. Uh, you know, we had at that time an Office of Consumer and Public Involvement that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and I think we're kind of uh, maybe trying to rebuild some of those relationships now. Uh, but why did they fall apart? So that's uh, the one thing about engagement. Uh, then my next thing I would say is uh, about drug pricing reform. Um, I think that uh, everyone, uh, many of us in this room have seen Dennis Morris's slide of all the organizations in drug review in Canada. Uh, you know, what's, what's going on here? Uh, who sets the price now? Is it PMPRB? Is it PCPA? Is it Cadeth? Uh, is it the provincial drug programs? Uh, we don't know anymore. I mean, how much overlap is going on here uh, and how much waste of resources are we doing? Or we see here 
from these multiple reviews are looking at the same things. Um, you know, that's a big concern, I think, to me as a patient. Uh, we'd like to see less duplication uh, and more streamlining. So if some of this relationship building between CADETH and Health Canada, uh, PMPRB, uh, is happening, then that's great. But, uh, you know, maybe we'll get there. I'm not sure. Um, that's about all I have to say. Well, I may have a little more. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your, uh, your really good presentations. It was, uh, it was quite informative. I uh, gave up following Cadeth a few years ago because you re Cadeth really paid little or no attention to mental health issues, uh, whether it was on the, the boards or otherwise. Uh, hopefully that's going to change under the, the new regime, particularly uh, with the mandate letter from, uh, from uh, the Prime Minister, not only recommending the review that you're undergoing, but recommending that mental health issues be uh, uh, on, the, uh, on five ministers' agendas. So hopefully that's, go that's going to make a big difference. Um, I've had the opportunity to collaborate with, uh, with uh, many people in Health Canada. Uh, and uh, was one of the originals uh, at OCAPI, uh, which looked like it would have some uh, 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 significant uh, uh, possibilities of engagement, but I guess the, uh, we were too mouthy and, uh, uh, and got under the skin of too many people. <clears throat> but when you talk about collaboration, it would be nice to have you um, just uh, explain a little more what you mean by collaboration. Uh, far too often, uh, you're enga we're engaged uh, as collaborators, only at the end to be told that uh, thanks for your advice now, uh, bugger off, and uh, uh, we're going to make our own decisions. And it's very disheartening, particularly when you spend significant amounts of time with CIHR or uh, other groups that say they really care about patient engagement and they don't. Um, one of the things about mental health issues is that uh, depression is, is uh, so closely linked with suicides. It's a life-threatening illness. Uh, it's not given the priority that life-threatening illnesses are given uh, in other areas. So I, I'd like to sort of hear a comment about that and maybe a commitment that uh, um, recognizing that a mental health issue, uh, which frequently is, is, is uh, far too frequently, is comorbid with a chronic disease, um, and, and suicide is the only way out. So it would be nice to hear something on that. Um, I got a whole bunch of other notes here that if uh, I haven't seen the website that uh, that you talked about uh, at Health Canada it would be uh, helpful if we could have a website to to refer to uh, the material you gave us was really quite quite helpful. Um, the, uh, the the question of collaboration, having uh, worked with Health Canada and uh, uh, looked at Cadeth and PMPRB, it would be great to see one super uh, organization. Uh, rolling all of that stuff in so we only had one group to follow and one group to engage with. I think that would be really, really helpful and it would cut back on the very significant overlapping that I think currently, and <clears throat> what comes to my mind is when we're talking about costing, I don't know uh, if anybody around here, uh, Wayne, uh, looks at the cost of doing the costing. Uh, who's, who, what, what's, uh, what's it cost to have Cadeth and PMBRB and everybody else uh, with the uh, 36 million uh, over here and 20 million over there, what what does that cost? Could we reduce that and, and reduce the cost of medications? Um, I think that's uh, the one other thing on in terms of Cadeth, and you mentioned surveillance, uh, and I I've worked with the uh, chronic disease uh, surveillance gang, and it would be really nice to see some collaboration there as well because there's terrific data. That, that would be interesting to, for us to look at, because patients are whole people. So it's, if you look at just the siloed uh, surveillance on chronic disease and siloed surveillance on HDA, it, 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 it's difficult sometimes to pull that material together. And if you looked at the patient, whether they have a rheumatoid arthritis or depression <coughs> or whatever, um, we can look at it from a patient-informed um, approach. <coughs> Um, so those are the, 
it's, it's nice to see the progress is going in, in collaboration. Um, it, would be, uh, it would be really nice to see it end up in something very significantly uh, relevant to the 21st century. Thank you very much. Well, you give me a tough act to follow. Um, so, first of all, I've been working in the healthcare field for about 27 years right now. And this is the first time that I've seen um, bodies such as Health Canada and uh, Cadith working together. So I applaud you for, for you know, doing this, this work uh, together and doing reviews of drug in parallel. So where you have this pilot project in oncology where you're reviewing uh, drugs through Health Canada and also through PCOTR and you've saved seven weeks, which is fantastic because in the life of a cancer patient, which is who I represent, that means can mean a lot. Now the issue is, where are the other two bodies? Um, you've got PCPA um, that is not present or is not working with you in collaboration and we know they're the ones who negotiate the drugs prices or listings uh, with the manufacturer and the province on behalf of the provinces. And then in oncology, we recently have uh, CAPCA, the Canadian Association of Provincial uh, Cancer Agencies, um, who are getting involved in decisions and funding uh, for cancer drugs. So it's kind of a guacamole kind of game where you <laughs> kind of hit one on the head and then you've got two more that, that, that appears. So. Uh, my my question to you and and Wayne, sorry, you're 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 you know sort of not representing any of the groups there, um, other than yourself, I guess, in your comments, but they're very good. Um, is when will we be seeing the the four agencies, uh, especially in cancer, working together and saving times for for access to medication? So that's my first question. Um, the other question is maybe more uh, sort of. I would say granular in the sense that uh, Health Canada, you have your early scientific advice process where you invite patients to comment on uh, clinical trial and, and de clinical trial designs. But the, the goal of the Health Canada uh, review process is to get drugs approved onto the market. And the types of trial that you require are very different than what the trials that P coder or CADIS requires, which are more comparative to drug or comparative trials to standard therapy. So they're very different types of trials. So from from you know a, a patient's perspective, you know where we would probably have a, a lot more say is what does that mean from the patient's perspective for the clinical trial design, but also what could we be willing to give or take uh, when we do comparison between the standard therapy, which is also really important. And I would assume the pharmaceutical companies they don't have you know the types of resources to conduct you know two sets of trials. So how can we work? more closely to make sure that we as patient organization provide you the information that you need to, d to decide what kind of clinical trials would be relevant for your reviews and then work with the industry to identify what those trials would be um, so that everything could be done faster, sooner, and better so we can get access faster and sooner and better. All right, why don't I start? Can you hear me? Yes, okay, great. Okay, website. First of all, um, about two weeks ago, we um, developed the, the website. It was early days, so before that, there wasn't really um, much reason. We didn't have a whole lot to say, um, but n now we know what the projects are, the scope is. So we do have a web page. Um, it, it's a, a sort of a one-page landing page, and what I can say is it exists. Um, so if you actually do a search, I don't know what the, uh, if you do a search on regulatory review of drugs and devices, it'll pop up. Um, I don't know what the actual uh, address is, uh, but, but there are plans for that moving forward as well. Uh, we want to, once um, the charters are completely approved and signed off by the ADM, we want to have a summary of each of the different projects and also um, milestones and a consultation, um, you know, milestones as well. So that's um, there and uh, more is planned for that. So that's good news. Uh, the second thing that I wanted to, to talk about is um, 
the, um, with respect to that healthcare system need, uh, really want your comments. And um, from there, um, with respect to the prioritization policy, we're also going to have a survey that's in the works, and we're going to come back with a um, plan and policy, so you can have a look at that, and we're going to consult on that as well, um, or are looking for comments on that. Um, and I want to also go back to the origins of regulatory review of drugs and devices and how we came up with those 15 projects. Uh, basically, I went around, I, I, you know, I was basically told, okay, this is your job and, you know, this is what you're going to do. And I was really thrilled about it because I had worked in the um, regulatory area before, very operational, and, and saw areas for improvement. So I went to each of the DGs for all of the different directorates and kind of said, so what is something that you really want to do that you haven't been able to do, you know, over the years. And so this is really where I, you know, we got these projects from. So yeah, SAP, you know, that's been a, a chronic problem for a while and there have been little fixes, um, but this is a, you know, looking at a really big fix here. So that is moving and there's going to be a, a, a consultation paper coming out um, before Christmas. That's the plan. Uh, so all good news there. And uh, the lead on this, Nadia Giancaspro, she has been working for about 12 years in the SAP area and is really herself surprised at how much this is moving. So um, that gives you an indication for, you know, there are these projects that, you know, if it was easy to do, it would have been done already. So a lot of these things are, you know, things that, uh, you know, a can of worms kind of that we want to really fix. Uh, all right, what else? Uh, Cadeth and PMPRB. Um, yeah, uh, this is something that's really neat. Um, I mean, before Cadeth, um, you know, I read about them and thought, oh, wow, basket of countries. Um, we're always going to be in the middle, kind of, in terms of that. I've been reading a lot, but had never met Brian O'Rourke, et cetera. Um, but now um, we have quarterly meetings and discuss um, areas of where we can collaborate um, to improve those three A's, uh, Health Canada not so much on the affordability side, but the other two definitely. Um, so Cadeth and PMBRB are meeting quarterly, so that's brand new um, in the last six months. Uh, we haven't done that before. So this is all progress and all good. So we're moving in the right direction and fairly quickly. Um, uh, in terms of the what, what's hot, this is hot. What's not, maybe me. I'm getting a bit haggard by all of this. But <laughs> so I'm a little tired. But uh, <clears throat> anyways, that's just the truth. Uh, so uh, that's about it, I think. Have I answered all of your questions? I may have missed some of them. But uh, is there anything in particular you wanted me to um, touch on that I haven't already? Yeah, the ongoing relationship building about when you okay. spend input and then just get a polite. Yes. Okay. Uh, we um, have hired. Um, now, this is, um, yeah, I can't really talk about um, the past. Um, but there were budget cuts, and that's where the cut happened. Uh, we, um, within the, the directorate that is taking the lead on this, um, we have hired um, an individual um, to coordinate the consultations for these 15 projects. She unfortunately had, um, we, she was to come on the end of October. She has pneumonia, and she's still away. So... Uh, 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 didn't want to speak for her, but uh, the, there is a plan for that as well. And on the website, uh, we will be talking about consultations and when they're taking place. So, uh, so for this project, uh, there is definitely a plan in terms of consultation. Just if I could add just one quick question. There are hundreds of consultations federally and provincially going on. Uh, from the pro from the patient uh, group side of thing, patient engagement is really important, but money's important too. Uh, and so we've been work we've worked, for instance, with CHR to say, okay, if you want patient groups as part of the the research, you've got to put money in there to pay not just the travel and what have you, but a, a, a per diem. Uh, I know that that issue is coming up into in other areas, and I'm wondering if. That's on your radar because it looks like there's going to be a fair number of consultations coming up. 
All right, we have her, uh, Louise mentioned that at the consultation that we held in, on September 27th, and uh, have spoken to my boss, Kathy Parker, regarding that. You, a number of you, I'm sure, have met her. And, uh, you know, that, sh she's aware. Um, and uh, right now, um, I don't have any answers for that, um, but uh, it, she is definitely aware. So I, I know that we can pay for costs of, of uh, mm -hmm. uh, patients coming to consultations. Beyond that, I'm, I'm just not, I, I don't have the answers for that at all. But that's where we're at. It's just disappointing to be sitting beside a doctor who's being paid his, his or her daily fee. For the and we're, I think we're providing better information at the consultations. Anyway. Um, un understood, and I hear you. All right, I'll go next. So with regards to the different organizations, I often, when I talk, um, have a, like an infographic that kind of says, here is where Cadeth is and how we are different from Health Canada and PM, PRB and the public plans because we're all asking different questions. Um, Health Canada really is looking as the drugs come through, is, you know, does, does it work? Does it, does it do what it says it will do? And PRP, PMPRB looks at, is the price excessive? Cadeth looks at, well, how does it compare? How does the drug compare to what is currently being used? So it's much more of a comparison rather than does it work? And that comparison might include, well, it typically always includes cost as well as the uh, clinical effect effectiveness and a few other things too. But then when it comes to the plans, we can look at it and say, yes, this is cost effective, but then the plans have to look and say, well, can I afford it? Do I have the money right now to be able to, to, to do it? So that is partly why you have different bodies looking at the same drugs as they go on through, because it's these different questions. Um, with scientific advice, that was another one about how patients can be, be involved there. And a lot of that is really looking at um, outcomes. What outcomes are really important to be captured in that clinical trial? Regardless of whether that clinical trial is comparing placebo to the new drug, which is a challenge, I know too, when, when physicians are there with a patient, they're not looking, well, do we do nothing or do we give you this drug? They're looking at, well, which of these two drugs or which of these two therapies, whether it's, you know, something supporting counselling versus a drug, do we do? So either way, with the scientific advice, the key, key element is looking at, well, what outcomes are really important? And that ties me into a lot of, for the Common Drug Review and, and PCODA, the most important use from my own perspective, and I'm, this is here where I'm talking from my perspective as a patient engagement officer, is that patient input comes in, and it comes in, we need it there early as we begin our review, because the patient input will help our team look at what outcomes are the most important outcomes should we be looking at as we assess that evidence. So it's the same with that scientific advice. Is the outcome looking at um, fatigue rather than mortality? Is it looking at frequency of exacerbations, exacerbations in the nighttime versus the daytime? So these are the, the key elements and that carries through in terms of scientific advice. Um, relationship building, That's, that is something that we have been working on at Cadeth and we can do a lot more of and we can be building. But over time, um, I began at Cadeth seven years ago in kind of the knowledge mobilization area. At that time, we had one person, very hardworking woman, um, who was doing it part time, supporting patient en engagement, among with other things. It's now grown and grown. Um, I'm dedicated to do patient engagement. Um, I have another colleague who's dedicated to do patient engagement. We have a director who is a director of patient engagement, among with other, th other things. So it's building those relationships and it's building those opportunities, whether it's coming to events li like this, having emails backwards and forwards during an assessment, um, 
introducing the, the thank you letters as, as we do to be able to build all of these things. And I know with some of that, with the collaborations and the consultations, um, it needs to, to certainly be two-way, um, having people from Cadith, I know Brian O'Rourke does, does what he can, having other members of the team to be able to, to, be able to come and um, to be able to share and to be able to listen and to, and to build those, those there. Um, and I guess the last little thing I've noted down in some of that transparency and, and on our Cadiths website, we are having more and more and more being available. A lot of it, I know, comes a little later. I know a lot of it is still highly technical, but there is a lot more um, be, being available, and, and I, that, that's certainly going to be uh, something that, that continues. So anything else there that... Great. If I might just make a couple of quick uh, comments uh, in, in response to the, the uh, panel's uh, uh, comments earlier and, and also those of my colleagues. Uh, <clears throat> before uh, today, uh, Louise had said to me, I hope you can talk about value-based health outcomes in your, uh, in your presentation. And I thought about it, and I couldn't because, unfortunately, it's not really a, an important factor uh, in that PMPRB system or world. Uh, and even if it should be, it's hard to know how it could be, because a PMPRB is not a payer. It's not a funder. It doesn't run a drug plan. It doesn't make any decisions about who will be covered or who won't be covered. It doesn't make decisions about what drugs can come to the market or not come to the market. It doesn't do any of those things. But the people who do have those responsibilities do have a very significant and important role to play in trying to address value-based health outcomes as my colleagues up here in the panel have, have, have indicated. And if I put on my Cord hat for a minute, Cord, of course, is a very strong advocate in this area, as, uh, as, as you know. And we have been trying to work uh, closely with, uh, uh, with a number of the public payers in particular on how best to develop performance-based uh, reimbursement, uh, uh, whether you call it managed access, pay for performance, coverage with evidence development, risk sharing, I don't care what you call it, but we're, what we're talking about is a system whereby you ensure that you, are, you, you, you make drugs available, treatments available to patients where you can monitor and whether it's working or not, whether you have stop and start criteria, if it's not working, it's not effective. And this would be a great way to address the outcomes issue. It would also, I hope and believe, would help to address the challenges of funding. Uh, because it's not an open access, well, we just we list this drug and then anybody can be prescribed that drug. No. So uh, we're, we're strongly supportive, uh, and I'm, I was so glad to see that such a big part of today, because we would uh, really like to see more advances in this area as well. We're with you. Um, can I just make, uh, you know, one uh, question for you, Wayne? I just don't want to let you off the hook here. Oh, shoot. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I think Sophie said we're done, so no. sorry, Martine. <laughs> sorry, um, this morning there was a, an article that was uh, published, or there was a press release, and this is from the Montreal Economic Institute, um, that speaks about the, the title which caught my attention um, was Access to Medication, uh, Preserving a, a Fragile Balance, and it, it, it's about the pricing of drugs um, and the PMPRB review, where it, it actually sort of uh, indicates that if Canada, the PMPRB, goes with the regulations that are planned, uh, or in terms of the number of baskets of country, we would fall probably from, right now it takes about 90 days between a drug being approved by Health Canada and launched uh, in our Canadian market. And that, num that number of days would probably go in, in anywhere between 500 and uh, 200 um, days. Does that make sense? I'm just trying to, to read this here. So basically what it says is that Canada is going to fall way behind in terms of the, the, the launch of drugs being approved here in Canada or being launched in the market as, as after being approved. Um, I mean, this is the first time I've seen something, something that was outside uh, an outside analysis of the potential regulation. Wondering what your thoughts are on that and the timing of listing of drugs in Canada or reimbursement. 
Yeah, or I, access, I, I should say. Sorry. Yeah, thank, no, thanks, Martin. Thanks for drawing that to my attention. I have not seen that yet, and I will certainly look at it. But what it goes towards is something that, that I have raised with PMPRB and others is, has anybody done an analysis, anybody in government done an analysis of the impact? It's not going to be easy to do. There are so many factors involved in this. It's not going to be a straight, you do this and this will happen. But I think there is a need for an analysis, and I hope we'll see that in the regulatory impact statement that they're required to produce, uh, an attempt to identify what the effect will be. Uh, because we, we do know, just from, as I said earlier, from some preliminary type work that the, the board did itself, that it appears that in where, where you have tougher conditions for funding, and this is looking at certain oncology drugs in Canada, where you have tougher conditions for funding, uh, that you have delays in launch and availability of, of products in Canada. So uh, it's, it, it's just, some of this is common sense. Remember when uh, 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 Diaz was up here this morning, he said, what are the incentives? Mm -hmm. if, if the incentives, I can come into this market pretty easily, or I can come into this market, but I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna take a big hit on price, or I'm gonna wait five years until I know what price was allowed, and, and have delays, et cetera. What, what are you gonna do? It's, it's, it's incentives, and, and people can be, say, well, that's, you know, that's the terrible pharma industry. Well, it's kind of a rational behavior, isn't it? It's, it's what anybody would do in those circumstances. So it's very tough to know this, and, and so I think that it's helpful. I, I, I can't say it's good, bad, or indifferent, but I think it's helpful to have more people asking those questions and challenging uh, a government to do more analysis uh, uh, of those kind of uh, Im implications. So thank you so much, and thanks again for a great panel and great comments from our, our judges. <laughs>